Okay, you know that thing where if you're thinking about getting a dog, all of a sudden you just start noticing dogs everywhere? Walking down the street, you're just like, you have dog vision. Or, you know, like if you're having a baby, you just notice strollers everywhere and people wandering around with babies. Um, We're going to do that for your brain today, but for seaweed, after today's episode, uh, every time you go to the beach, you're going to be looking and noticing just how much seaweed is out there and thinking about what you could do with that seaweed. Today on the show, author and seaweed expert Amanda Swinimer joins us to talk all things seaweed. This is Meet Me in the Stacks, a podcast for bookish people. Welcome to the show. All right, so welcome back to Meet Me in the Stacks. Today we have Amanda Swinimer with us. Uh, Can you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, yeah, so I'm Amanda, and um, 20 years ago I founded my business, Dakini Tidal Wilds, hand harvesting uh, wild edible seaweeds off the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. Um, And my background is marine biology. I have a Bachelor of Science in marine biology. Um, So I've also, over the last 20 years, become a seaweed educator and the author of two books about seaweeds. And I do a lot of speaking and teaching about sort of the health and nutritional properties of seaweeds and the absolute critical ecological role they play in uh, protecting the planet. Absolutely. So we're going to get into all of that, the science of, of seaweed and the importance of seaweed. So to begin with, can you tell us, like, where did your journey with seaweed begin? How did you first get interested in seaweed? Uh, well, it kind of took a bit of a meandering path to, to get to the seaweed. Um, but it started with the ocean. I had a really deep, passionate love for the ocean for as long as I can remember. Even though I grew up in Ontario, which is very landlocked, but my dad is originally from Nova Scotia. So we would drive out there every summer and um, I just fell in love with the beach. At a very early age, I wanted to um, become a marine biologist and study whales and dolphins. Uh, and then um, I ended up tree planting out west and falling in love with the west coast. Um, I did my university degree in Halifax on the east coast and started getting really interested in wild foods and um, harvesting my own wild foods from the rainforest. And uh, I actually took a third year algae physiology class at UBC. I did a semester at UBC and I was kind of the weird one in this very sciencey class asking if you could eat any of the seaweeds that we were looking at under microscopes. And uh, yeah, I was just really interested in that. So I guess when I landed out out on the West Coast, I sort of melted together my two passions of uh, wild harvesting my own food and um, being in the ocean all the time uh, with the seaweed harvesting. So I just fell totally in love with it. And you've been doing it for 20 years, is that right? Yeah, actually, this will be my 21st season. I, I founded my business in 2003. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about uh, like seaweed harvesting and how what that industry looks like. So um, you would be like a commercial, are you commercial, I guess, a commercial seaweed uh, harvester? Yeah. What does the commercial seaweed harvesting industry look like right now? Like, how does it work in terms of regulations? Um, how do you harvest and how do we harvest and use seaweed sustainably on a commercial level? Um, well, when I started 20 years ago, um, there was me and two other people in the entire province that I'm aware of who were harvesting seaweed. Um Dr. Louis Druel and his wife, uh, Ray Hopkins, 
they were started hand harvesting edible seaweeds out in Banfield in the 80s. Um, and then there was a woman who's still in business. Um, it's called BC Kelp. She started off in Sydney Spit, and um, now she's up, I believe, based out of Prince Rupert. And that was it. And all of us were very small scale, um, just hand harvesting. And fortunately, um, there already were regulations in place, and the, the regulations for a commercial wild harvester um, in BC are that you have to cut the seaweed that you're harvesting in a place where it will continue to grow and regenerate. And right. where that is specifically varies a little bit from species to species. So you have to harvest by hand and you have to cut it in a place where the seaweed will continue to grow, much like pruning your bushes or cutting your grass. And seaweeds are among the fastest growing organisms on the planet. So if they are left attached and cut in the right spot, they're incredibly regenerative. Nice. So what about for non-commercial seaweed enthusiasts? Now, I know I've seen a lot of back and forth about this, particularly like in the beefs and bouquets section of the local paper here in Nanaimo. There's always stuff about, you know, people harvesting from the beach and whether that's a good idea or whether it's not and how much we're allowed. And, you know, people, it's kind of one of these contentious um, ideas that people have. So how, how do we do personal seaweed harvesting? What are the rules around that? Um, and is it okay? Is it sustainable? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Um, so because the seaweed industry has been so small, although it's growing um, incredibly rapidly right now, not the, the wild harvest really so much, but the uh, seaweed farming, which is a a whole sort of different area, but um, yeah, because they just didn't have the the humans to, you know, enforce regulations or things like that. I've sort of dealt with that, and I know other seaweed enthusiasts or colleagues that I've had have sort of dealt with it in a similar way. Where if I see people out sort of ripping up a bunch of seaweed, you know, I just go and have a conversation with them because. Nine times out of 10, they, you know, want to be doing it sustainably and they just, they have not get gotten the education to learn how to do that. Um, so the, like if you're harvesting just for personal, um, there is a limit on how much you can harvest. I'm not sure what that is offhand, but you can find that on the provincial BC uh, website. But um, it's, they could, if there's more and more people that are doing that, they could uh, put in regulations for personal harvest. They've done that in, I believe, like Washington State and California. But at this point, they haven't. But there are, uh, there have been um, cases where people have told me that people are out with um, harvesting lots and lots of, of seaweed in a sort of not sustainable way that, looks like it might be going toward the commercial market that sort of um but i haven't heard anything like that lately so i don't think it's a huge problem here in bc i think the number one thing i would recommend anyone who wants to harvest their own is just to get the education to be able to do it sustainably right so what are some some tips when you're when you're looking at getting into um either learning about seaweed or harvesting seaweed for yourself? What are the really important uh, things to consider when you're doing that? I, definitely um, not just ripping up plants from the rocks, right? Yeah. The number one rule, don't rip the seaweed up. If you rip the seaweed up, it's not going to regenerate. Um, so that's sort of the number one thing to keep in mind. But there's a lot of other things to keep in mind too. Um, you want to have an abundance of the seaweed that you're planning to harvest in that area where you're planning to harvest it. So if you see one little clump of, you know, say rockweed and that's it, that's not a place where you want to go ahead and harvest um, that particular seaweed. Um, you also want to know how that 
particular seaweed you're planning to harvest reproduces. Seaweeds are incredibly diverse. Um, they span two different kingdoms. Um, so they have all kinds of different ways they reproduce. And some seaweeds have separate reproductive structures. So it's incredibly important to leave those reproductive structures intact. Um, also, again, really, you need to know about the, the specific seaweed that you want to harvest. So for seaweeds that have uh, a stipe, which is sort of often will look sort of like a stem, comparable to a stem on a plant, but not always. Um, if the stipe is cut on any seaweed that has a stipe, then that seaweed won't regenerate. So um, I kind of say education, education, education. <laughs> um, yeah. The other thing people do, uh, seaweed takes an enormous amount of space to dry. And so I see people, you know, getting a little overzealous at the beach, harvesting it because, you, you know, you can harvest quite a bit pretty quickly. Um, but then when you, they get home, you know, often the seaweed sort of goes to waste because they find that they don't have the, the space to actually dry it to preserve it. So that's another um, consideration as well. Right. Don't don't take more than more than you can handle. Definitely don't right? take more than. Yeah, you can process. And, and I always, you know, when I harvest, um, you know, the health of an ecosystem is really an exchange of, of give and take. So if you're taking something from an ecosystem, I recommend making a plan to give something back. And that can be uh, personal. It can look like a lot of different things, but um, something that I, I always try to keep in mind. Yeah. One of the great pictures in the book that I can't remember which book it's in, it's in one of the two, um, is it might be in both. Um, one of the great pictures is the bull kelp drying in a tree. <laughs> nice. <laughs> which is I is yeah. very aesthetically pleasing. So yeah, you you do definitely need somewhere to to hang all of all of the seaweed once you've yeah once you've gathered. And you can you can hang the seaweed um, you know, when you first get home from the beach, the large kelps, you can hang them in the tree, but then is soon it might be different on on the east coast of the island where you are but here in the southwest um, it gets moist as soon as the sun goes down all summer long so you can start it off in the trees and get the drips off but eventually you're gonna have to bring it inside if you want it to dry up completely so keeping that in mind as well <laughs> right you're gonna need like a seaweed room of some sort well not not necessarily but if you um you know, you can take it inside and hang it on like plastic hangers. You don't want to use anything metal or like wooden um, clothes drying racks. But but again, you want to, you know, kelps are big, big, large seaweeds. So you want to try and plan ahead of time sort of where you're planning to do that drying. All right. So let's talk about some of the uses for seaweed that that are out there. So what what are some of the uses of seaweed? Um, well, I sell all my seaweed as food. So um, it's definitely a incredibly, it's the most nutrient dense food source packed with minerals and vitamins and protein and fiber and essential fatty acids. Um, so it's a great food source. Um, there are also um, companies, uh, including a, a great local company called Seaflora that make um, a whole line of skincare and spa products with the seaweed. Seaweed's been used um, in that way, like bathing with seaweeds and, and rubbing seaweeds on the skin for millennia. It's called thalassotherapy. So that's another use of seaweeds. Um, there's a, a picture in the book, the alligator in the tub, the alligator kelp. Uh, yep, that's a really fun one to use in the bath. That one's called Costeria costata, or five rib kelp. Um, and it gets quite lo both long and, and quite wide. So it's uh, 
a definite crowd pleaser when we find that down at the beach. <laughs> but um, yeah, bathing in seaweeds, it's um, been used to sort of calm the central nervous system, um, induce feelings of well-being. Uh, it's incredibly nourishing to the skin. Uh, it helps dry out lactic acid, so it can help relieve uh, muscle pain and arthritic pain. It's a great anti-inflammatory and detoxer. So it's really, um, uh, you get a lot of the wonderful benefits of, from seaweed by bathing in it or using the seaweed-based skin creams. Nice. So let's, let's talk about seaweeds and the environment. So why is algae important to the health of the globe? Great question. So um, I'll just give a tiny, quick little seaweed algae 101 um, okay. so people uh, can understand sort of the, the difference or the, the similarities. But seaweed, seaweeds belong to a larger group of organisms called algae. So um, seaweed is sort of a colloquial term for marine macroalgae. So there's tiny, tiny little microscopic algae, um, some of which are have a bacteria-like cell, but they all photosynthesize. And then seaweeds, again, are what we call macroalgae, the larger algae. Um, this is the most First group of organisms on the planet. They span many kingdoms and two different domains, so they're taxonomically very diverse. Um, so when I use the word algae to describe some of these amazing uh, environmental benefits, that includes both the microalgae and the seaweeds or the macroalgae. So as a group, algae provide an estimated 50 to 80% of our oxygen. They absorb an estimated one third of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, they're a really important source of um, the, forming the nuclei for clouds. So there's certain types of microalgae that when their cells are damaged or they die, they release dimethyl sulfide into the atmosphere, which reacts with oxygen to form um, essentially uh, the nuclei for cloud condensation. And it's a really important um, process in regulating sort of global climate. And also algae are the primary producers of the world's largest ecosystem, the ocean. So if we look at our blue planet, it's, it's mostly it's two thirds ocean. And it really is sort of one you know, there's more than one ocean named, but it's sort of like this one interconnected ocean. And algae um, take the energy from the sun via photosynthesis and provide the nutrients at the base of the oceanic food system. Right. So super important. Very, very important. Yes. Among other things that they provide, but those are some of the real global reaching ones. Yeah. And how was, uh, this was, I outsourced my questions to some librarians, see if anyone had any seaweed questions. One of the questions that came up was, um, how is climate change affecting seaweed either here uh, on the coast or just in general? So I would say, um, I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in microalgae, although that's my latest passion that I'm trying to learn more about. So I will speak to um, what I see as probably the most significant concern when it comes to uh, seaweeds or macroalgae. So uh, kelps, which are a type of brown seaweed or a group of brown seaweeds, um, they upward growing kelp form kelp forest ecosystems on about a quarter of the world's temperate coastlines. And phycologists, a phycologist is a biologist who studies algae, um, they estimate that they are at a global rate of decline of about 2% per year. And that though there are many factors for this decline, 
uh, the most significant driver is an increased incidence of marine heat waves. And kelp, they need cold water to grow. Um, so even small increases in ocean temperature can first affect their ability to reproduce. And then if the temperature gets, gets even higher, it can actually kill them outright. And when kelp forest ecosystems are um, killed, like large swaths of them can be killed off by uh, marine heat waves, such as has happened in uh, Western Australia and in Northern California and Oregon. And uh, often when these kelp forest ecosystems, which are among the most productive ecosystems on the planet and support a huge amount of biodiversity, there's a real ripple effect throughout the ecosystem. And they're often replaced by what's called a turf ecosystem. And a turf ecosystem has seaweeds that, that don't uh, they don't grow upward so they don't provide the structure that um, that provides habitat for creatures they're just like a, a ground bottom covering and this results in a, a significant decrease in bio, both biodiversity and productivity so I would say that's probably one of our most um, sort of immediate, concerns with seaweed um, in regards to climate change. Um, I can briefly mention um, some uh, concerns with the microalgae, and that is our loss of coral reefs. So um, mm. coral uh, is dependent upon a symbiotic relationship with microalgae to provide some of its nutrients. And if the water gets too hot, um, the microalgae leave the coral. And if they stay away long enough from their relationship with the coral, then the coral will end up starving to death without the nutrients that the algae provides. So, hmm. so let's talk a little bit about your books. So tell us, uh, tell us about your books. Um, well, I... Uh, I had been teaching for quite a number of years and over those years, a lot of my students, I, I'm really interested in um, seaweed and, and the amazing health properties that seaweeds have. And, you know, often students would ask me, oh, is this, do you have all this information in a book, uh, you know? And so I hadn't really considered writing one, but it was sort of the seed was planted. Um, I love writing, so the seed was, had sort of been planted. And then I just do like sort of a morning writing practice most mornings before I kind of get going with my day. And I found that I was writing often about the experiences I've had out in the ocean harvesting seaweed experiences with amazing ocean creatures and experiences that felt, you know, somewhat spiritual to me or um, just contemplating life's sort of ups and downs, things like that. So I decided, I said, okay, well, I would love to, like, I had every seaweed book I could get my hands on. And I found that they typically dealt with just one or two subjects, like they would be an identification book or a recipe book. And I sort of wanted to tell this um, comprehensive story of seaweed. I, I it was really important to me that there was um, uh, sort of an emotional connection to seaweed to share with people. And then also um, really dig into the studies that have been done on seaweed and health. Um, I have a science background, so I feel like I can help understand the science and then present it in a way to people that maybe don't have that scientific background. Uh, I wanted to dig really deep into um, some of my the local species that grow here. Um, and talk about not just, you know, one thing to do with them, but a description and how they're harvested and their health benefits, how you can cook with them. 
Um, and then I did want to share sort of the story of uh, how seaweed has risen from strictly a health food in this part of the world to uh, a culinary treasure. And um, very, I'm very grateful that a lot of the chefs who um, cook with my seaweeds in their restaurants were willing to contribute one of their favorite seaweed recipes to the book. So, um, so yeah, I just, I wrote, uh, ended up just writing the book like that. And so it was very much a labor of love. And I pitched it to a couple publishers and um, Harbor was interested in it right away and said that it'd be a great idea for me to um, write a book about seaweed for kids too. So that's, that's what I went ahead and did. Yeah. It seems like a great topic for kids as well. Kids. Yeah. I mean, kids, kids at the beach is just, it's a win-win for everyone. It's, they have so much fun. There's endless things to explore. Um, they're so naturally curious and, um, you know, I've taught kids, you know, right from the, the beginning when I started teaching seaweeds, I've been teaching in um, the public school system and homeschool groups. And it's just really exciting to to be teaching kids and watch them light up when they're having fun exploring the different seaweeds. Right. So the, the book for kids is called The Science and Superpowers of Seaweed. Mm -hmm. And the adult title is The Science and Spirit of Seaweed. And they're both really great, fantastic, very readable, you know. Sometimes, yeah, science books and especially, yeah, um, identification guides, you know, they're not necessarily readable titles. These are very easily digested and readable experiences. Lots of great pictures, lots of great recipes, things like that. So mm -hmm. for the... I, it's definitely a great starting point if you're vaguely interested in seaweed in any capacity it's probably a good place to to start out yeah and and there are the you know the books are similar in a lot of ways um but one of the i guess a big difference um is that the kids book the science and superpowers of seaweed it includes seaweeds from both coasts so like I said, my dad um, is from Nova Scotia, so I spent a lot of time there. I also went to university there. So um, I include some, some East Coast Atlantic species. And then there's a whole section in the kids book where we explore the kelp forest. So the kelp forest, if, if you've read either of my books, you will know that it is my favorite place on earth. It is just the most mystical experience to swim through this glowing emerald green water with these massive underwater trees, essentially. Um, so we take an exploration and we look at all the different zones of the kelp forest and the seaweeds that grow there and the creatures that call the kelp forest their home. So that was um, a really fun, fun uh, section of the book to include in the kids book. Very cool. So besides the books, what can folks do if they want to learn more about seaweed? If they want to learn more about seaweed in person, you give tours, occasionally seaweed tours? Yep. So I do uh, different styles of teaching in, in the fall and winter is sort of the, the off season for seaweed. So I do a lot of teaching just in classrooms and I'll have... Um, a variety of seaweeds I've harvested for people to taste and any fresh seaweeds that I can find washed up on the beach that time of year. Um, and then in the spring and summer, I do um, uh, two different sort of offerings. So I do a seaweed tour, which is essentially uh, a 90 minute um, trip to the beach at low tide to look at the seaweeds growing the natural habitat, talk about IDing seaweeds, their health benefits, some of the ecological benefits, getting to taste some of the uh, local seaweeds. And then I also offer full day workshops where participants uh, do a little bit of hands-on sustainable harvesting, uh, drying techniques, 
and get quite in depth about um, the nutritional and health properties of seaweeds as well as as some of the um, ways that they help to protect our planet. Awesome. So folks are interested in learning more about that. Where can they find you on the internet? Um, So all of the information for all of my classes is on my website, which is dakinitidalwilds.com. So that's D-A-K-I-N-I tidalwilds.com. And you can also find me on Instagram uh, at Dakini Tidal Wilds, and I post uh, all of my upcoming workshops and classes and things like that on Instagram as well. Brilliant. Well, Amanda Swinimer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. All right, huge thanks to Amanda Swinimer for talking seaweed today. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Go check out her books and her website and all things seaweed related. This has been Meet Me in the Stacks, Vancouver Island's number one seaweed related podcast. If you want to learn more about the show, check us out at www.virl.bc.ca slash podcast. And if you want to come down to the library and check out a book, we're now into our Sizzlin' Summer Savings promotion event. Check out two books for the price of one, only at your local library. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Meet Me in the Stacks. Cookie, cookie.